be alive. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to iFocus Online. And this is our lecture 133 and glaucoma session 37. And today we have with us Professor Ramanjit Sehota, ma'am. And she'll be talking on important studies or clinical trials in glaucoma. I request Dr. Vanita, ma'am, to please introduce Professor Ramanjit Sehota. Thank you, Radhika, as usual. But um, let me just tell you that of all the guests we have had, Professor Ramanjit Sehota really needs no introduction to, uh, to an audience, whether national or international. Yet, it gives me great pleasure to uh, say a few words about her illustrious, very illustrious career. She is currently in, uh, leading the uh, glaucoma team at Shroff Sai Center uh, in Delhi. Uh, she only recently took up this position, 1st August this year. But she has been associated with the RP Center uh, for Ophthalmic Sciences at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in um, uh, New Delhi for many, many, many years where she has been responsible for churning out so many ophthalmologists year after year after year. She was uh, not only heading the clinical services, but also the glaucoma research facility there. She completed her MD in ophthalmology in 1982 and her FRCS from Edinburgh in 1984. She has won the World Glaucoma Association Research Recognition Award in 2011 and numerous other international and international awards for research in glaucoma, especially those pertaining to angle closure disease, glaucoma surgery, as well as imaging in glaucoma. She also spear uh, headed the national task force in uh, glaucoma and has uh, taken a lead in rationalizing um, the treatment of primary angle closure disease uh, in Southeast Asia. She, uh, of course, has written several textbooks. Um, she has uh, been involved in uh, revising Parsons, the, the Bible of every uh, undergraduate, actually, postgraduate. Uh, it becomes a little uh, abridged, uh, diseases of the eye, many, many, many times, and has written several chapters in books. In fact, uh, her latest book, A Practical Approach to Glaucoma uh, in 2021, um, is a case based approach to managing glaucoma and is uh, exceptional. And at the end of her talk, I would uh, request her to say a few words about this book. I'm sure our uh, attendees today will benefit greatly by uh, going through this book. She has, of course, published uh, hundreds of papers uh, in peer-reviewed uh, in index national and international journals. She's a member of the International Glaucoma Research uh, Society, the very prestigious one, and um, has been part of the Glaucoma Advisory Group and Project Evaluation Committee of the Indian Council of Medical Research as well the Postgraduate Committee of the Medical Council of India, the Executive Committee of Glaucoma Research Society, Asia Pacific Glaucoma Society and committees of the World Glaucoma Association. She has also been uh, one of the past presidents of uh, Glaucoma Society of India uh, in its uh, nascent days. Um, so with these words, I would like to invite um, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Amanjit Sehota, a very warm welcome to you from Team CFS to deliver your talk today on important studies in glaucoma. Thank you, Dr. Vanita. I think you've taken all the time for my talk, so I think I'm just going to make it as short as possible now. So uh, what I'd like to say is that important, uh, I, I hope, the, yeah. The important studies, I think we have to, to talk about in terms of their relevance to clinical mm -hmm. work today. So if we look at it, we can see that, you know, there are uh, all these interrupts. Could you please share your screen, ma'am? Okay, just one second. Okay, all right. Is that visible now? 
perfect ma'am yeah perfect okay all right so we are we are talking about uh, these studies from the point of view of of how relevant they are to glaucoma practice today and uh, as i was saying you can see that you know the percentage of people actually going blind from glaucoma seems exceedingly high starting with africa but we are not doing too well either so we have to see how this helps us in our management and we have to remember that though the blindness due to glaucoma has decreased still 15% of patients even diagnosed recently with glaucoma progress to blindness in america so we don't have data for india but when we look at the randomized control trials i think we have to think about why they were done so uh, glaucoma has been uh, identified and treated for over 100 and maybe 120 years but uh, what we had learned through clinical practice was not considered adequate and therefore evidence based medicine required that we have these randomized control trials to help us to determine a number of things so the randomized control trials were aimed at in the initial period to see whether therapy actually affected the natural course of the disease finally to also see whether therapies that were available actually worked in the way they were supposed to work and uh, in the way they were supposed to work for glaucoma basically means did they control the iop did they prevent progression or did they decrease progression however the caveat is that most of these randomized control trials were done on primary open angle glaucoma and only a few on primary angle closure disease so if we go on and look at the glaucoma biomarkers by and large people talk about optic nerve head iop and perimetry uh, and most of these randomized control trials were done in the 90s at a time when the oct was still not uh, being used for glaucoma diagnosis or management the additional one that we as indians want to see is the use of gonioscopy which was not done in any of these uh, randomized control trials but we have to then sort of Uh, tell ourselves how relevant it is to our practice so if we look at the population iop in india and probably around the world it sort of varies between 14 to 16 mm of mercury and with glaucomatous optic atrophy causing uh, uh, damage to the optic nerve one has to determine what kind of intraocular pressure we want for the optimal function of the optic nerve and people have suggested in terms of percentages if it's 28 mm of mercury drop it by 20 mm 20% but that only brings it to 22 drop it by 30% it brings it to 17 so we still haven't reached the normal pressures which are between 14 and 16 so th these studies have all tried to help us to determine what we should do with each patient so let's start with uh, those talking in terms of ocular hypertension then we'll talk about early glaucoma moderate glaucoma and severe glaucoma because that would help us in in relationship to what we are going to do with treatment so the ocular hypertension treatment study all of these studies looked at about 200 300 patients but what they actually did was they recruited patients who had an intraocular pressure between 24 and 32 mm of mercury who had no visual field loss who had no glaucomatous neuropathy so basically what they were saying was that if a 0.3 cup a cup between 0.3 0.4 you could see that there was no thinning of the inferior neuroretinal rim the the uh, circumlinear vessels were exactly where they should be along the rim of the the cup and the aim was to see was it possible to prevent these eyes from going into a uh, a uh, glaucomatous optic neuropathy and if they did progress they wanted to know what were the risk factors so if we look at the results that they they published and they published many papers over the years and now the follow up is up to 13 years so since it was done in caucasians and africans on poag patients they looked at progression both by visual field and by an optic nerve head reading center so people actually looked at stereo photographs to determine whether there was a change over time this is something that we don't do now so i'm going to keep reminding you that this was in the 90s when a lot of the things that we have today were not available so the patients who were untreated showed an uh, a fall in iop mild of fall in iop 4% those who were treated had a, a fall in iop of 22.5% at the end of 5 years 
29.5% uh, of the untreated and 4.4% of the treated progressed. At the end of 13 years, it was 22% 22 of, 22 of the untreated and 16 of the treated. So basically what they were trying to say is regardless of lowering IOP to this level, this was the IOP they reached, even at this level, about 16% of the treated people progressed and 22% of those that were untreated still continued to progress. So the median time to progression was less in the untreated. That means it was earlier in the untreated and later in those that were treated. So what they showed us was that if you drop the pressure, intraocular pressure by say approximately 20%, you can delay progression, but it will still occur in about 16% of eyes. And those who progressed were likely to be older patients who already had a raised IOP at, at uh, baseline, a cup disc ratio which was large, higher than the others, and a pattern standard deviation saying there was already some abnormality in the visual field. They also found on a post hoc analysis that a thin uh, cornea was a major risk factor. The uh, African American race seemed to do worse. So, what did we learn out of the ocular hypertension treatment study? That the patients could be put into a stratification by risk. Those who are older, those who have a higher baseline IOP, those who are beginning to show some glaucomatous changes on the optic nerve those with thin cornea, uh, corneas, these are the ones that we should be treating. The rest, it is relatively safe to delay treatment. But it told us nothing about what happens if the ocular hypertension was accompanied with angle closure. They had no Asians. And at that time, prostaglandins, rock inhibitors, and beta blockers were not available. So again, this is not something that we can transpose to what we do today. A similar study called the European Glaucoma Prevention Study actually uh, recruited similar patients, said IOP 22 to 29, but treated them only with dozolamide. It didn't say 20% fall in IOP, it just said use dozolamide. What they found was that untreated and treated groups seem to progress at the same rate. And the risk factors they found were very similar to those of the oaths. So what we learn out of this study is that the placebo also reduced IOP. We, uh, the uh, fact that the risk factors were similar tells us that these are the major things we should be looking for in patients who have ocular hypertension or who are POAG glaucoma suspects. So when you are trying to treat a primary open angle glaucoma suspect, please remember that high IOPs, thin CCTs, older patients, those with a family history, those with a large cup disc ratio are the ones that you're going to treat. So in this patient, if you look at her, you can see that the uh, visual field is absolutely normal, but you can see the thinning of the neuroretinal rim inferiorly. The cup disc ratio is large. So you are definitely going to treat this patient. But the question is, was 22 enough? No, 16% still progressed. So in such patients, probably lowering it below 20 is maybe a better idea. What about early and moderate open angle glaucomas? The first trial to look at these patients was the early manifest glaucoma trial or the EMGT. Again, it was POAG, Caucasians and Africans. They said the IOP had to be less than 30. They didn't take very advanced glaucomas and for six years they followed them up. Half were untreated and half were treated. So these are the two studies, the OATS and the EMGT that actually looked at natural cause of the disease if it wasn't treated. So what they found was that again, the untreated progressed faster. The untreated actually had uh, a progression which was almost similar to those, of, uh, which was sort of half that. Sorry, I'm, I'm, let me just say it again. The untreated had double the, the risk of uh, progression of those in whom the intraocular pressure could be lowered by 25%. So the progression was either by visual field analysis or on the, again, photography of the optic nerve. And this was seen in more than half of the patients. So you could see that there's a significant pro, um, progression that is likely if we do not treat patients who already have early or diagnosed moderate POAG. The risk factors they found were not baseline IOP, but they said a mean IOP is important. 
pseudo exfoliation, which in this case, because this was done in the Scandinavian countries is very common. They said pseudo exfoliation is a high risk for progression. And they said, if you have low blood pressure and your IOP is never very high, that is normal tension glaucoma, that may be another risk factor. So out of this study, what we learn is that the risk decreases by 10% for each millimeter of mercury that you reduce from baseline to the first follow-up visit. That means it, it, it shouldn't be that you're treating patients for five years and at the, five, at the end of five years, you've suddenly lowered the IOP. It has to be a lowering as soon after the first visit and it has to be maintained through the follow-up. So here, what they've tried to emphasize is the mean IOP across the follow-up. The collaborative in initial glaucoma treatment study looked at something slightly different. They didn't take patients who were untreated. They said we are treating all patients of POAG, again, with early to moderate glaucoma POAGs, and we're going to treat them either with medication or a trabeculectomy, which may or may not be done with 5-fluorouracil. Again, they looked at the visual field, they looked at the accurate IOP, but they took a, a mix of patients. You know, there were some who had definite glaucomatous damage, some who had a raised IOP alone, and the medications could be anything, topical, oral, lasers, and only at the end when these didn't work, surgery could be thought of. Trabeculectomy, on the other hand, if it failed, could have a laser, could have uh, topical medications and a repeat surgery. So again, you can see there's a mix of, of uh, individual sort of patients who were recruited, a mix of things that were done to the patients, but they again followed them up for a long time. So it gives us some sort of indication of what's likely to happen to patients. Patients come to us when they're a sort of 50 years old or 45 years old. We have to think that the life expectancy these days is almost 90, 90, 90 years. So what we want to know is what's going to happen to them in 10 years time, 20 years time. And these studies have actually given us a kind of, of uh, vision of what our patients are likely to do. So in the collaborative initial glaucoma trial, what they said was whether you use medications or surgery, the visual fields were similar or changed similarly till five years. Medications reduced the IOP by about 35%, surgery by 48%. But if you stratified your patients by the amount of damage they had, those with a greater damage, that is a, a mean deviation of less than minus 10 decibels, did better with surgery. Looking at the risk factors, it was, again, if they already had some amount of uh, visual field loss, the greater the loss, the greater the chance of pro progression. Patients who were older were likely to progress. Africans and diabetics, progressed even faster, even though the lower uh, the pressure was lowered. So the take home message from this study was that a personalized IOP could actually prevent progression if we looked at the mean deviation at the initial um, uh, evaluation. And anybody with a great, uh, less than minus 10 decibels, we did an early surgery. We have to remember that the only medicines available at that time were timolol, pilocarpine, and dipivephrine, which I'm sure some of you have not even heard of. So these days, medications are better. So again, is this actually something that we can trans translate into our therapy today? What about laser trabeculoplasty? I think lasers have been done for a long time. So there was a glaucoma laser trial follow-up which was done for over seven years at a point when an argon laser was being evaluated as compared to timolol, which was the gold standard at that time. What they found was that the argon laser trabeculoplasty actually lowered the IOP 1.2 millimeters, not much, but 1.2 millimeters lower than timolol. The use of additional medications was of obviously less with the laser group and more with the timolol. And the visual field at the end of these seven years retained uh, the, the um, um, uh, did not progress as much with lasers as it did with timolol. So the take home message, possibly we could consider that for early POAGs, a laser trabeculoplasty, either argon laser, or as we shall see later, this is a, a patient, uh, this is a trial which has recently been done. It's called the light trial, again, looking at trabeculoplasty, 
but this time using selective laser trabeculoplasty. And they again re recruited ocular hypertensives and early POAGs. And they found that the medications, which are now the current medications, are equal to the, uh, the result in both quality of life and clinical outcomes at three years following the SLT. So again, SLT could be considered as a primary treatment for early POAG, even in the time when we have good effective medications available to us. So just to summarize this whole thing, if you have early POAGs, we have to remember that uh, a mean deviation, say, of less than six uh, decibels, you can see that the neuroretinal rim is completely lost. You can see the wedge-shaped defect here and a corresponding arcuate scotoma. So in such patients, you are going to try and bring the pressure down to 15 to 17 millimeters by medications, by laser, or by surgery. In moderate POAGs, what has been uh, described earlier, anything less than an MD of, of minus 10, you're going to again sort of try and, and bring do early surgery, bring the, pre the pressure down between 12 and 15, and quickly reassess progression every year because these patients are more likely to progress over time. The advanced glaucoma intervention study, though it says advanced glaucoma, actually looked at patients who didn't respond very well to medications. So in these patients, they were either advised argon laser trabeculoplasty first, followed if necessary by trabeculectomy, or they were offered trabeculectomy first and followed if necessary with a laser. And finally, both of them could have a second trabeculectomy. This is a very complicated study and the reports have come you know, thick and fast. And I think finally the post hoc analysis tells us the, the most. It says that if you keep an average IOP of more than 17.5, the chances of progression are very significant as compared to those in whom you keep an IOP of less than 14 millimeters on review. So if you uh, um, were Africans, you probably did better with the argon laser first. If you were Caucasians, you did better with the trabeculectomy first. But again, this is just to say that, you know, again, this, this was a time where a lot of medications were not available that we now have with us. So finally, in the post hoc analysis, what they found was that the only people who didn't progress were those that had a mean IOP of 12 millimeters of mercury. So these were the, theory, the, the medications available. The beta blockers had now become available, but the trabeculectomy was done without antifibrotics and the repeat was done with 5-FU. So again, is it actually something that we can relate to? I would say with a pinch of salt. So what do we do with patients who have a severe glaucoma and advanced damage? Early surgery is one option. And the second is to use all the good medications we now have available to us to try and bring the pressure down to between 10 and 12 millimeters of mercury. What about normal tension glaucoma? You're starting with IOPs, which are on the lower side. We know a lot of our medications don't work very well in those patients. So this study looked at patients who had actually documented progression. So this is the best possible study that one could have for normal tension glaucomas. And again, the endpoints that were looked for were visual field and optic nerve head. The aim was to reduce the intraocular pressure by 30%, either with medications or with surgery, but 30% was the goal. What they found uh, in, the, in the final sort of analysis was that if they didn't treat, the IOP hovered around 16. When they treated it, it came down to 10 millimeters of mercury. The progression in the untreated was almost 40%. So definitely lowering the IOP below 16 to almost 10 was what was required for these patients. So in five to seven years, glaucoma progression could be reduced by 50%. The risk factors were females, those who had migraine, and those who actually showed disc hemorrhages. So what is the take-home message for us? This was also a study done quite um, um, a few years ago when prostaglandins were not available. So one is you identify progressors. Quickly, you do three, four, five fields so that we can identify progressors. We drop the intraocular pressure more than 30%. It's probably better to think in terms of millimeters of mercury, 10 millimeters of mercury, 12 millimeters of mercury. And we know that the prostaglandins can reduce IOP even in the normal uh, range between, say, uh, 14 to 20. Prostaglandins work very well to lower the pressure. A similar study looked at patients for three years. 
and looked at the comparison between using brimonidine and tim timolol. And they found that the progression with brimonidine was less, almost one fourth of that with timolol. And they therefore said that the intraocular pressure drop was similar, but if the progression is less, that means that there may be some other aspect of that it is looking, uh, looking after the brimonidine. It could be neuroprotection, it could be decreasing the vascular reactive, uh, reactivity of the optic nerve head vessels. So if you see a patient like this, who's got a pale disc, and you can see the amount of choroidal sclerosis here, which is how we generally see our normal tension glaucoma patients, I think we should be thinking that from these studies, we've learned that the pressure should come down to 10 and 12. Finally, we have some primary angle closure disease uh, trials that have been done. This is the ZAP study, where they looked at patients who had primary angle closure suspicions, and they did a, uh, an iridotomy in one eye and left the other untreated. So what they were actually looking for was either a rise in IOP, if they could see pass at the end of the three years, whether the patient had an acute attack. What they found was that uh, the uh, number of people who progressed, half, it was half in the treated eyes and double in the untreated eyes. So they said it had a significant prophylactic effect, no serious adverse effects. But they went on to say that maybe we shouldn't do this as a so community sort of uh, uh, peripheral iridectomy for suspects. But they did this because in the exclusion criteria, they excluded patients who were positive on provocative testing. That means if you were to, to, to do a dark room prone provocative test and it was positive, those patients would have definitely gone on or would have been more likely to go on to develop any of these things. But because they excluded them, the significance of the difference between treated and untreated eyes is not seen. On the whole, the take home message is laser iridotomy is effective and safe. The EAGLE study is the other study that has been done on primary angle closure disease. And it took patients who had PAC or PACG, an intraocular pressure up to 30 millimeters of mercury, and did either phaco emulsification or, or laser iridotomy in the two groups. At the end of three years, what they were able to show was the intraocular pressure was 1.18 millimeters lower after clear lens extraction in the clear lens extraction group as compared to the iridotomy group. But they felt and they reported that the quality of life was better and it costs less to do a FACO than to do an iridotomy and follow patients up. So the take home message here is that the difference in the IOP was only one millimeter. So the clear lens extraction does not actually significantly lower IOP, but it does improve visual function. So patients feel that their quality of life is better. And because it's a surgery done once, possibly the costs are on the lower side. Surgical options for all glaucomas, I think we look at them, we've already been through two trials, the Aegis and the Sigits, which looked at it. And both of them said that patients with trabeclectomy first had lower intraocular pressures. The trabeclectomy therefore appears to lower the IOP much more than the medications do. The recent surgical trials per se are the TVT study, which looked at uh, the Barvelt drainage implant versus trabeclectomy. But the trabeclectomy had a very high dose given for a very long time. What they found was that the similar control of IOP was there at the end of five years. And the failures were less with the tube. But if you actually look at what the failures was, the, tra the trabeclectomy group had a lot of hypotony. The failure for both was 10% per year. And after a tube failure, only another tube was possible. Why with a TRAB, you could have other uh, options like another TRAB, another tube, other options were available. So the take home message from this is that if you have a patient with a history of a cataract surgery or a prior failed trabeclectomy, the efficacy of tubes are equal to TRABs. But the complications were because of MMC overdose, and therefore maybe you can reduce this to 0.2 milligrams and reduce it to one or two minutes of application. A follow-up study from this looked at using both the tube and the trabeclectomy as an initial therapy for open angle glaucoma. And again, at the end of three years, this, these two were compared. And what you can see 
from the results is that the trabeculectomy lowered the intraocular pressure more and therefore required less medications. The tube shunt, according to the, the uh, authors, was at a more favorable uh, safety profile. But you can see again that the high dose of mitomycin is continuing. Failures were much less with the trap than with the tube. And they finally said that, you know, you, if you stratify patients by their baseline IOP, high baseline IOP over 25 would probably do better with a tube shunt. But this was not what the original paper was meant to, uh, the original aim of the study was. There have been two trials comparing drainage devices, the Ahmed FP7 versus the Barwell 350 millimeter squared. And both of them have shown that the Ahmed lowers the IOP initially very well, but in the long term, the, the, the IOP is lower with the Barwell um, valve. Failures were 51% with the AGV and 34% with the uh, Barwell but the serious complications were much more with the, with the barbell. And there was a significant number of eyes which had a vision loss of more than two, two lines. So if we look at that, I think, and you've, you've heard the papers about uh, the trials about trabeculectomy, it, it, these should still not be used as primary therapy and probably only when a trab fails or you have very complicated glaucomas which you, where you think the trabeculectomy is likely to be fibrosed very quickly. So to conclude the surgical conclusions, the trabeculectomy lowers IOP more than medications. The long-term IOP control in PUAG is better with trabeculectomy as compared to drainage devices. The long-term IOP in pseudophagic eyes and after failed trap may be better with tubes that we're not very certain because they used very high doses of mitomycin. And the mix or the, uh, the, the minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries are still being evaluated. So to sum this entire talk up, the risk factors for progression identified across all the trials were older age, the African race, if there was already baseline optic nerve head damage or visual field damage, if there was a thin CCT, and in a few, uh, a lower perfusion pressure and diabetes have been identified as possible risk factors for progression. So when we have a patient like this, you can see that this eye is showing us a very thin neuroretinal rim, and this the other eye is probably a little bit better. What you see on the visual field is that this eye has been only minimally affected in the uh, visual field, while this has a much more significant damage. What we did do was we treated this very well, and we forgot to treat this as well. So you can see that there was a gap between when the patient first came and when the patient came back to us, a similar gap here. But at that time, this amount of damage had already occurred. So remember, even in a single patient, the two eyes are, uh, may have different degrees of damage and therefore both need to be taken care of and probably the better eye needs better control than the other. So this is probably something that we would have loved to see that both eyes are absolutely horizontal. There's no significant progression over time. There are target IOPs mentioned, as I said to start with, people have talked in terms of percentage reduction, people have talks, talked in terms of absolute numbers. So I think this is something that uh, we have to consider because we see very high pressures. And I would think absolute numbers probably make more sense to us in India. These are just a, a, a kind of summary of the, the studies that I've spoken about. And again, please see that the, the, the longest one is about 13 years, while our patients are going to go from here to here probably in 50 to 60 years. Keep in mind that the therapy available today is vastly different from what has been studied earlier. We have many new medications, many more effective and safe sort of uh, ways of doing trabeculectomy, drainage devices, and the mix that are there. So despite the lowering of IOP in all these studies by 20 to 50%, many eyes still progressed. So it was probably because they had put a whole group together and their target IOP was not individualized. So all glaucomatous eyes should at least have an IOP within the population normal, which for Indians is 14 to 16. Moderate to severely damaged eyes should have low normal, so probably you know, 12 to 15, and normal tension glaucoma around 10. Five to six fields should be done quickly to diagnose progression in the first one to two years so that you can readjust 
treatment as required. So all the trials have shown us the efficacy of lowering IOP in both delaying and preventing progression. So what we can do is to catch the glaucoma early, lower IOP to a, a, a individualized sort of target IOP, and keep looking for risk factors which can actually endanger patients. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ramanji Sehata. That was, uh, in a nutshell, so well summarized. All the major trials, uh, or the, at least the randomized control trials uh, in uh, glaucoma. Uh, Dr. Harsh and Dr. Pratip with their impressions. <clears throat> Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it was really, really wonderful because I think for the PGs, it was so beautifully summarized that instead of going here and there and trying to read between the lines of these huge studies, you have given them everything in a, a pearls of wisdom kind of thing. And uh, one thing I would definitely like to say that uh, when Vanita said that you have churned out a lot of ophthalmologists, what she actually meant was that you have, you have uh, taught those ophthalmologists with great care, love and nurtured them throughout life and one of them is me. And <laughs> we are so grateful to you because you have stood with us in all our painful moments and all our joyous moments. And you are always there for us. So I really, really am grateful to you. And uh, I want people to see that uh, behind this super uh, woman uh, with hundreds and thousands of papers and things like that, there is a wonderful, wonderful human being. And uh, yet, obviously, we will have to ask her some questions because uh, despite her trying to teach people like me everything, uh, we still are a little <laughs> innocent. So, so ma'am, like you rightly said that uh, uh, I think we'll have to individualize treatment for each patient. Uh, so uh, let us take, I think I'll ask only one or two questions because a lot of questions would be there. Let's say uh, the ocular hypertension study. Now you... Uh, if we very clearly see that despite lowering the, uh, uh, the pressure to 20% below, as they have said, uh, you still get failures. So what would your recommendation be? So let us say that there is a patient with around 27 millimeters of pressure. Disc and fields are absolutely normal. And there is, uh, let us say there is a family history and uh, in those kind of situations, where would you like to keep your pressures? So uh, I think 27, you've chosen very carefully because it's neither here nor there. If it was 22 or 24, I would say follow up. But 27 is coming close to 30. And I think that's what worries, worries uh, um, glaucoma sort of practitioners because at that point, you're likely to push the patient into a BRV or a CRVO. So I think with a pressure of 27, if we go back to the risk factors, if the patient is say 70 years old, you're going to be a little worried. If the patient has a cup disc, sorry, a, a, a PSD, even though the cup may be absolutely 0.3, a PSD of say three or 3.5, these, these may be small pointers to say that it's better to treat the patient. Already you have given us one risk factor that there's a family history. So all in all, I would say at 27, I would be uh, inclined to treat the patient and bring the pressure down at least to round about 20, 20 millimeters a month. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Pratip, please. Yeah. Thank you, madam. As usual. Well, you have totally mesmerized us and uh, it was a great learning and uh, who else can teach all these complicated studies better than you you did a very uh, good critical appraisal just a few points to add you know none of these studies were done in the Indian race so obviously there might be some racial discrepancy and uh, Indian patients may show some different results uh, I really don't know madam uh, would be able to come in uh, better on that. Uh, apart from that, you know, Madam has covered most of the things and uh, she has already told us that uh, the angle cruiser glaucoma was not covered so well in these uh, studies. 
when the natural history uh, natural history of glaucoma was covered so that is the one aspect uh, which we need to address uh, very aggressively uh, because the zep trial is also not a full proof trial and the eagle study uh, addresses altogether a different aspect of the angiosa disease uh, apart from that uh, madam has covered the trap versus the tube and uh, you know most of the things were were beautifully covered and uh, thank you madam we learned a lot there are many questions to be asked uh, just one question i would like to ask you know when we say that uh, the 10% reduction in the iop uh, reduces the 1 mm of reduction in the iop reduces the risk by 10% means that the if you reduce the iop by 10 mm of mercury then the glaucoma should not progress uh, is it uh, right no i i i would basically say that you know again that study was you know more of a natural history study rather than a treatment study because again the treatment available was very minimal they used beta blockers and and in some patients they used uh, trabeculoplasty so i think basically what he was trying to say i mean if is a high line everybody else were trying to say was that if you lowered the iop to say you know the the population sort of normal i think we have to keep in mind that these people never have the caucasians never have very high pressures so their high pressures are probably 24 26 and you lower the iop say to 20 and in some patients you lower it to 19 or you lower it to 18 that is what they were talking about but you are absolutely right that you know if you lower it by 10 mm say from 18 you lower it to 8 the chances are maybe they will not progress but if you lower it from 26 to say 16 the progression may still occur so it is it's a fallacy and it's basically talking in terms of the mean treated iop it's not talking about the baseline iop it is saying that the mean follow up iop if it can be reduced by another millimeter the chances of that patient progressing which we don't know in any case will have reduced by 10% so it is just a, st a statistical sort of thing not that it actually happens but it is based on the mean iop they kept emphasizing the mean review iop and the other fallacies you know in one of the studies the european trauma study where the placebo was almost same as the dosox the carbonic anhydrase in beta so what's what's the yeah what's what's the logic uh, <laughs> well they did not the, allow that to be published the, the americans did not allow that to be published for 10 years they they managed to publish that paper i mean the that study only when they found that the risk factors were the same as the odds but what this gentleman i heard him when he presented the the uh, the, the study initially what he says is that you know the placebo drop of 19% can you imagine that the, the iop dropping 19% could be related to the fact that the patient is less stressed but oats didn't show the same oats showed only a 4% drop so uh, whether there's a consensual effect of the dosolamide we don't know we don't know whether the dosolamide doesn't work and therefore the difference between the untreated and treated was they also had a lot of dropout because dosolamide is something that a lot of patients did not like in the long term so there was a lot of dropout in that study so all in all i put that study second because it's not something that people actually think was very well done but they're all happy that the risk factors were the same as the oats thank you ma'am yes ma'am Yeah, a few questions, ma'am. Uh, especially, you know, uh, related to angle closure. I know there are not that many studies, but um, uh, in the conclusion of the Eagle study, you said uh, CLE does not reduce IOP. I hope uh, it meant in relation to uh, 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 laser peripheral iridotomy. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. I think because this, uh, there because is this. This just, sort of, oh. sorry just in the previous lecture we had uh, dr surinder singh pandav uh, telling us that cataract re reduces pressure re removing of lens reduces pressure so i don't want uh, our uh, pg trainees to get uh, confusing ideas so basically so, what so i think we have to be a little careful 
uh, by saying, I, I very clearly said their paper says the drop in IOP as compared to iridotomy, I, I mean, in, in cataract surgery versus uh, laser iridotomy was 1.18 millimeters. Uh -huh. All right. So the difference was there, but it is not statistically significant. And again, the aim of the Eagle study, when it was first started, was to note the significant fall in IOP. But mm -hmm. when they presented the results, the results were presented as quality of life, cost, and in some vague sort of uh, paragraph, they said, oh, the fall in IOP was just 1.18. And the authors themselves very clearly said that this is not a clinically relevant drop. So if you read the Eagle, Eagle paper by Augusto, et cetera, you can see that in their own discussion, they say the drop was only 1.18 and is of no clinical relevance. So from that point of view, I think we should all be aware that you know these days everybody has a cataract surgery done so early that how many of our patients have pseudophakia and still have raised IOPs? Why are we treating them? If the cataract was actually going to be removed and control all IOPs, we should have no pseudophakia with glaucoma or anything else. Every Absolutely. second patient I see has pseudophakia and is on four medications. Yeah. Madam, it's a pandemic of cataracts, <laughs> I call it. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you 100% here. Um, the, with regards to the Eagle study, I have actually um, really read it minutely and all you need to do is actually look at the main table which is table number two in that they we are talking about a randomized control trial a randomized control trial did not have data 60 percent data on 60 percent patients related to indentation so they could have just been appositional closure, which, you know, at in advancing age, you can have uh, when the lens is uh, getting thicker. There is 5% uh, uh, who did not have any gonioscopy at all. So how on earth was angle closure diagnosed? On Von Herix? So there are many, many un unanswered questions. Plus, when I looked at their data, their uh, axial length was uh, 20, more than 22.5, which in the Indian context will fall under the normal age, age uh, normal uh, range. Because generally we find um, our, um, you know, uh, the axial length in Indian eyes to be between 22 and 23 rather than between 23 and 24. Plus the, uh, the, uh, anterior chamber depth also I have found that it was it was much much longer. so there, there are obvious differences there is absolutely no doubt that these things uh, cannot be extrapolated and I, I, the, the reason I was looking at all these things is because of the fact that they have reported such low aqueous misdirection following uh, clear lens extraction they, do, they don't call it cataract at all they call it clear lens extraction uh, because uh, most of the lenses were clear. So uh, these were the, the, the points that, that uh, I, I, I picked up and I was actually quite amazed. Uh, nonetheless, what do you actually think about uh, oc treating ocular hypertension post LPI in ang primary angle closure, no glaucoma? Again, I think we come back to the same uh, sort of risk factors. So we did do a study, a very long sort of seven years to 11 years study of PAC ocular hypertension as compared to the ocular hypertension with open angles. And we found that the PAC with ocular hypertension was more likely to progress. So right. they progressed in almost 19% as compared to 7% in the POAGs despite us lowering the pressure to round about 18. So in PACG, despite the iridotomy and despite medication, the chances of progression are more than in open angle ocular hypertensives. So I think we should be a little bit more careful. And as you know, we are all aware that you know, the iridotomy only takes care of the relative pupillary block. Mm -hmm. There could be other mechanisms which still mm -hmm. continue and therefore in PACs, 
we need to be a little bit more careful with the follow up treat them a little bit more sort of than you would uh, 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 an open angle ocular hypertensive but also follow them up a little bit more closely so you wouldn't give any cut off where you know beyond which you would definitely treat if they are ocular hypertensives in angle closure 26 i think my my cut off has been over the years that if it goes above 26 then i get a little worried as i said it is basically a, a, as far as the veins are concerned and then i would be more inclined to treat uh, pacs i would be following them up much more closely because for some reason they do seem to show a, a, a fluctuation in iop which as i said could be because of other mechanism of angle closure which have not been taken care of and that possibly leads to more progression right uh, okay so let me get this clear i'm sorry uh, uh, when they have high pressures post lpi in pac no glaucoma you will still watch it till 26 only you will watch it more closely absolutely Thank that's you. absolutely right thank you that is the message i actually got from the paper that you're talking about which uh, you know uh, not being um, not having been discussed in the uh, in your talk Anyway, the other point is about ocular surface disease, which is a, a, a big thing these days, that uh, uh, although we have the medications uh, and although we have newer and newer medications, the, the newest ones seems to be causing more uh, hyperemia and consequently uh, ocular surface disease than ever before. You asking me or you're asking yes. somebody? Okay. Yes, 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 yes. As, as far as I'm concerned, I think this ocular surface disease in glaucoma is hugely overdone. Yeah. I, I find that every patient who is uh, given, uh, say, prescribed Zalata and has, and has been prescribed, say, you know, Cystain Ultra is so happy with the Cystain Ultra and will use the Cystain Ultra regularly and will forget the Zalata. <laughs> so uh, I think there is no necessity for everybody to be given something for the ocular surface disease. It's only when patients do have a problem. And because our patients are on the older age group, you will find that you know a lot of them may have dry eye. But as far as the medications themselves are concerned, we know our usual pro uh, suspects. Brimonidine, dozolamide, these are the ones that are more likely to cause us problems. Ripotec, that you're rep the repacidol that you're talking about, and the Nitalo or the, uh, they, yeah, they, they will actually cause problems. But after about a week or so, these problems seem to go. And again, thankfully, they don't happen in every patient. So I think we have to be a little cautious about our prescription of, you know, any of the lubricants just because we are prescribing medications because it actually dilutes them. If you think to yourself that you're putting you know, glaucoma medications and waiting for it to be absorbed and you're then putting in lubricants three times, uh, I mean, it must have some effect on the absorption of the glaucoma medications. So yeah. I, I would only prescribe them if I could actually find some evidence of ocular surface disease or there is a very significant dry eye, there's no tear meniscus and the patient is you know, symptomatic. I'm really glad you said that because you see, I also never at the same time, if I'm seeing a new patient diagnosing a new case would start uh, on a lubricant simply because it is very likely that they will continue with the lubricant and not with the glaucoma medication. Uh, un unless they actually have si uh, signs or symptoms of it, uh, uh, you know, I at least uh, refrain. But it wasn't just um, um, the... Um, the hype, you know, the hyperemia that you're talking about in uh, in uh, both uh, repressidil and netarsidil, I am finding it to be really disappointing in the sense that it seems to be continuing for for patients and uh, the patients, if they've had surgery in one, one eye and if they are, uh, you know, that eye becomes completely white without medications and the other eye in stark contrast then, then looks redder and they keep uh, commenting about it and not just they coming and telling, uh, telling the practitioner, but also the fact that their, uh, you know, uh, family members and friends 
seem to comment about it. Uh, you don't find that in your practice? No, Vanita, that basically means that they are ready for the surgery in the other eye. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually a stimulus for them to get operated in the other eye. <laughs> well, if the pressure is controlled, you really don't want to take that step. But, uh, you know, I, I'm finding that more and more and uh, a little bit disappointed with the effects of... Uh, uh, anyway, I, I, I think nitacidil seems to have more of this than the ripacidil. Yeah. So I would say that, you know, I have seen probably, I think about maybe 10% who have some redness with ripacidil and then it gradually does come down. I mean, probably only about 5% may still continue to have some redness. But with nitacidil, on the other hand, I think I have a patient, I actually gave a sample to him and he sent it back to me the next day and said, no, I don't want to use this medication. So, you know, it's, uh, it, it is, it does occur in some patients, but I don't think it's that bad. And I have now started just telling patients beforehand that this is going to cause redness, use it regardless, and you'll find that it will settle down. Would you like to use an astringent drop along with that? Uh, I don't think so. Sometimes you know, if the redness is, you know, like Vanita said, it's very tricky, then sometimes maybe if it has helped I, out some of my patients. I, I suppose you could try it. There's no harm. Don't, 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 you know, kind of. don't give refreshed tears, give, <laughs> give a, a, a astringent, but I'm not sure that, you know, that it takes care of the, the basic problem because no, the, if the patient is reacting. Problem, but socially, when the patient goes out, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Or something like that. You <laughs> <know>. <laughs> maybe. Well, occasional SOS use. Yes, SOS, exactly. Yeah, I had an 82 year old gentleman just come in today who were, you know, didn't want surgery immediately because his uh, great granddaughter was getting married. So, <laughs> but didn't want the red eye. <laughs> so I said, I, I, you know, there is, uh, there are no magic uh, wands here. Anyway, uh, any further questions related to this? Because we don't seem to, we seem to have exhausted our uh, Yes, and I think we've also all all sort of got <laughs> enough. <laughs> uh, enough of our studies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. See you. Bye. Thank Bye. You, Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much, Pam. Bye. Bye. Good night.